Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage here in Vancouver for Open Source Summit 2023. I'm John Furrier with Rob Streche, my co-host. Got a great guest here, Callista Redmond, CEO of RISC-V International, open source instruction set. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you so much, great to be here. So we've got a great view here, we're looking out in the water here in Vancouver, great venue, Open Source Summit. Interesting time and in, in place here, Open Source has kind of won the game. Proprietary software kind of leveled out, it's the industry dynamic. Um, all aspects of the ecosystems are emerging, you're starting to see ecosystems. You're involved in one, risk five. Talk about your ecosystem, what are you guys doing, what's the project? You know, I think it's really interesting when you think about the arc of history, you're like, wow, you know, open source is, rules everything, proprietary is no longer on trend, right? Um, when you look back historically, it was about 20 years ago, 22 years ago, in about 2001 that everyone was flustered about, you know, certain organizations kind of, you know, kind of owning the software stack or, you know, a license for a piece of hardware automatically came with a license for someone else's software. And that frustration led to massive investment in Linux, right? Open source software. So IBM went and planted a billion dollar flag on Linux and said, you know what, we can have proprietary plus open source, let's play in both. Fast forward 20 years, here we are, and the world has gotten fairly flustered mm -hmm. with someone else controlling their destiny at, at the microarchitecture level. Yeah. So, instruction set architectures, you, for the most part, have mm -hmm. two flavors out there, Intel and ARM. And the world said, you know what? My strategic investments and future is controlled by these other companies. What if there was an open option? And that's really where RISC-V is taking off as an open standard instruction set. And I would draw the distinction, not as much on open source software, but it's more like open standards. Yeah, yeah. So do you remember when proprietary networking <laughs> happened in all the data centers? Oh, yeah. That SNA, drove, Decknet, all those stuff. Bingo, yes. and that drove decisions on what you put in your data center. Wow, who's controlling your destiny, yeah, right. right? Okay, along comes Ethernet the game changed. Ethernet yeah. is a global standard yeah. that says, you know, compose your data center however you wish. So that's why we're taking it as a global standard to compose your microarchitecture how you wish. Because this is a huge point because I remember those days, OSI model, and there was a seven layer stack, if you remember, and we what really happened was it was the physical data link layers are the ones that were the most important at the bottom of the stack. Yeah. The rest were kind of, then TCP IP came and then the rest yeah. was just app, app layer. But TCP started Cisco, but that standards made everything happen. Right. That created a massive wealth creation, innovation wave that we all look back on and take for granted. We've been covering supercomputing, supercompute, you're seeing silicon in the clouds. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a super stack, that's what we're calling it on theCUBE, a super stack model. Supercompute, physical, chip, data center, super cloud layer, and now a super app layer with AI built in up and down the stack. This is the developer framework that we're seeing, this, this super stack phenomenon. You guys play right into that where the developers are in charge. What do you think about that concept of yeah. super stack? Yeah, well, the, the concept only works if you have some level of freedom. Freedom to pick and choose between you know, what, what platforms you're going to run on, how can I be portable among those platforms, and developers are demanding and insisting on that kind of experience, right? So having the freedom of choice and the freedom of design go hand in hand. And so you are seeing that, and you are seeing sort of this renaissance around custom processing I mean, the growth in semiconductors alone is saying like a one size fits all approach doesn't have to work because we can take a custom approach and get to scale and volume as well, right? Whether it's adding AI yeah. onto existing data center workloads, adding even more capabilities into that cell phone. You know, we have uh, RISC-V uh, processors helping to support the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth in cell yeah. phones all over Asia today. We see them adding AI and acceleration yeah. capabilities and everything from data centers at, you know, at Alibaba to HPC yeah. machines in the European Union. 
So you're seeing that yeah. freedom of design meet up with that you know, choice. Rob, we've uh, been talking about hardware matters on theCUBE and hardware is now software. Yeah, I, I think that's I mean, the interesting thing is, and I, I think people are trying to look at it if you see, I mean, obviously you have the AWS's of the world, my former employer, so they yeah. go out and build their own uh, under the hood types of stuff and you know, other cloud guys are doing the same. How do you see that really impacting the uptake of what you're doing versus what they're doing yeah. where it's just abstracted and it's, hey, don't worry about this, yeah. it's under the hood versus actually bringing people in to get involved at that lower level. So the value drivers are different depending on the stakeholder, yeah. right? So if you look at the stakeholder as the cloud provider, they want to lever down costs, they want to increase energy efficiency, reduce right. blueprint uh, of data centers to use the same workloads while increasing their competitive value by weaving in AI and accelerated workloads so they can attract more customers and grow. So their motivations are very specific to composing the best semiconductor, as well as system, as well as network, as well, you know, you name it, as you know, developer platform comes next, that they can possibly deliver. Mm -hmm. Because any, you know, pennies on that is going to have a very substantial impact on their business. Right. And so the cloud providers, or the hyperscale themselves, has a very different strategic intent than the developer, right? Who wants to have portability across multiple different types of cloud, as well as be able to take advantage of AI, be able to take advantage of you know, any of the other capabilities that come with that. So motivations change, but at the end of the day for both of them, they want a composable environment. And that composable environment could be in the hardware or at the, at the platform level. Talk about the uh, use cases that you see on with RISC-V. What are the hot areas that developers are working on? Obviously you yeah. mentioned you get the Bluetooth example, Wi-Fi example. Um, we're seeing a lot of innovation in hardware right now. And, yeah. and not, I mean, not to say that speeds and fees were out of, out of, but I remember like, go back a few years, Rob, every event, the big companies like, don't talk speeds and feeds, yeah. we're <laughs> solutions. Uh, and like ultimately, people want the, yeah. no one wants to run their workload on slower infrastructure. I mean, I'm, well, it know, depends. If it's policy based, maybe. What's it the use case? Well, no, I say it depends because it's sort of analogous to do you want to put in uh, gold plated uh, plumbing in your house? Well, those plastic pipes do just fine, right? So, right size it and, and get the right tool for the job. And, you know, that has a lot to do with power and speeds and feeds and what have you. What, what, are, what are the challenges you're trying to meet? Mm -hmm. So, where is Risk V going? We started seeing a lot in embedded and IOT and some of those form factors that said, I need you know, lots of these, but they're really kind of a small you know, kind of piece of the whole puzzle. Uh, and that has now moved into, I want to use RISC-V to gain a competitive differentiator in my system or in my overall solution. And so you're starting to see things creep up uh, uh, you know, more up the value chain as we, in parallel, grow the ecosystem around some of those heavier workloads. And so that's where you're starting to see, you know, additional capability added into existing investments. And that's important. That's important because if you're sitting at a large multinational and you've got a massive investment already in a particular architecture, let's say one of those other two that I yes. mentioned, yes. and you go to the boss and say, you know what? Today, let's rip that out and like throw in some risk five and yeah, everything's going to be wonderful. What about the millions invested, the systems already being supported, all the other surround that happens for those existing investments. So multinationals are taking some of those baby steps. So some of those, you know, near term, like let's get our feet wet. Mm -hmm. let's, let's, you know, start there. Where you see a lot of venture capitalists investing in, you know, more startups and design houses on Risk Five than any other architecture in history, saying like, "All right, but what can we do new and different?" And so you see companies like Esperanto or Andes or Sci Five or MIPS and others coming out with data center class chips, because they don't have some of those legacy decisions that they're going to have to rest on. And so that's where you're starting to see that next frontier 
move up the value chain or, or up the uh, How the has stack. the supply chain issues been impacting the developers? Has that been a factor? Yeah. So when you think about supply chain, it's also, is, you know, it can start to get into some of the, the political boundaries between different things. Mm -hmm. Um, the supply chain has definitely affected across the industry, um, but what you're starting to understand is that the more there are constraints in the system of actually getting the hardware that you want, the more uh, there is appeal for open standard approaches. So if you put up those false barriers and say, well, you know what, I reduce the, the level of risk in investing here because I know that, you know, the the IP is not going to be held hostage by you know, any country or company, or the decisions behind that IP are not going to be held by one company alone. You have that freedom and you have that additional flexibility that unleashes more investment on the open standard approach. I mean, the investment in ethernet connected <laughs> solutions yeah, yeah. You know, went off the charts, <laughs> exactly. right? I mean, so, so that picks up the, the, the forecast. I see on my notes here, risk five device shipments will reach 27 billion by 2027. Yeah. Benchmarks are doing great. You got good developer traction, good VC investment, you got an ecosystem. Yeah. What's the driver behind that number? What's the real tailwind that you guys are taking advantage of right now? Yeah, so it's a couple of things. Um, more demand for processing in places where it started growing and now is exploding. Like look mm -hmm. at automotive. We're projected to be 10% or more of the automotive uh, electronics by 2025. Mm -hmm. You see that going on across industries. You see new types of workloads mm -hmm. like AI that are really kind of sinking their teeth in at a custom processing level mm -hmm. because that it takes massive computing power. You know, the, the large learning models and, yeah. and other inference and generative AI requires a lot of compute power. And to get to that, you start to get very deep into custom processing. Do you, do you have a concentration, uh, Not I wouldn't call it an issue, but is there a concentration of companies that are really adopting it? Like you said, automotive, and that makes a lot of sense because especially as the move towards EVs and things of yeah. that nature, that, and they want to control more of their destiny. Uh, and even the operating systems that are going into the cars, right. they're trying to be more open about what they're doing. Is that a, do you see that as verticalized concentrations with those types of companies? We or? have some of that, yeah. right? And you know, so data centers and hyperscales and HPC, they kind of are grouping yeah. together and kind of doing things that are symbiotic or synergistic yeah. to one another. You also you know, continue to see that in consumer devices, in mobile. Mm -hmm. uh, Qualcomm, 650 million cores shipped last year, yeah. right? I mean, that's a testament to a strategic shift that says, you know what, we are no longer going to just tie our wagon to one architecture, but right. taking a hybrid approach or taking a, a you know dramatic shift to something where they have that level of control. Plus, you mentioned uh, Ethernet, so I have to ask, and got processing power, obviously, in the Risk Five. Is there an Ethernet aspect of Risk Five? Because you see, it comes like we Broadcom. see a lot of edge processing and, and networking and mobile and in there some are of the five G and the some of the chain, control. Like yeah. yeah, yeah, we see we see a do lot of that activity Broadcom going or, on. Or you partner with Broadcom, or how do you? We haven't we haven't had a huge engagement with Broadcom, but you know, many are working on things with Risk <laughs> Five. You know, just back in back in the uh, the home shop. And yeah. uh, I heard Amazon's got a, a Broadcom alternative to the license, to the point of yeah. licensing. Right. I mean, that's right. The, this is part of that proprietary. So those large companies that have massive buying power are looking at alternatives. Yeah. Every hyperscale that I've ever worked with over the last 15 years has always had additional yeah. options. What's our plan B yeah. that they're yeah. working on in the R&D part? they always check up the license at any time. Right. And, and then when you look at, you know, like the European Union, a lot of that R&D gets consolidated into other organizations mm -hmm. or into, you know, EU funded activities. And that type of thing happens around the world with other governments as well. Calista, thank you for coming on theCUBE and sharing the story. Give you the final last minute. Put a plug in for Risk Five. Yeah. What events are coming up? What are you guys looking to do? What's on your agenda? What yeah. are some of your uh, goals? 
So the most important thing to do with Risk Five is actually join the community. I promise you will get more than your dollar figure out of that relationship. We are amplifying the stories of our members constantly. That momentum and that scale is something to hitch on to. Second thing about joining in, that's where talent is cultivated and that's where you have the strategic insight to drive your own companies forward. So joining on as a member is really critical. Uh, we are at a phase in our lifespan where that engagement is driving where we go next. Second, um, we're going to have a Risk Five Summit in Europe, in Barcelona, in the uh, second week of June, June 5th through the 9th. That would be a tremendous time to get out and meet with the community, engage in the technical as well as industry momentum that we're seeing. So those would be a couple of things that I would uh, talk about. And then lastly, if you're looking for training and certification, uh, we've just launched our uh, first Risk Five certification exam and have supporting uh, courses now to go with that. Calista, thanks yeah. for coming on. Calista Redmond, CEO of Risk Five International. Very prolific in the instruction set. Got a great ecosystem booming, um, hitting an inflection point. As open standards will drive innovation. This is theCUBE, all the coverage here. And Open Source Summit. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>